Hi students, welcome to uh, Principles of Marketing, Marketing 3336. Uh, we're going to be discussing Chapter 11 today. Uh, it's an extension of Chapter 10's discussion on pricing. Uh, in a, this is our additional considerations and pricing strategies, really talking about some additional thoughts on pricing and price applications and products and services. Uh, and and uh, today we'll talk about some of the core pricing strategies and some other pricing strategies that are utilized in different industries as well. So let's first start off by reviewing something that I think is important for us to consider again, which is, this, and now this figure is extremely important for us in thinking about price considerations. So I'm gonna review it again briefly because I think it's really important for us to understand, and it's probably one of the most prevalent figures for understanding where the price of a product is set. So when we're setting the price of a product, uh, oftentimes when we think about the product itself, we, we start off with what's called our product cost, which is down here. Our product cost, and, 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 and that's how much it costs to actually produce our product or to execute our service. And down here, that's what we call floor pricing. And that's the floor. That's like, it, it, assuming we charge any less than that cost, we start to lose money on the sale of every unit of that product. So that's what we call the price floor. We generally speaking do not want to go below a price floor on any one product because we'll be losing money on the sale of that product. So that's the lowest we could go on a product. On the other end of the spectrum is what we call the price ceiling. And you see that that's the higher price. That is, that is the highest price in which a consumer sees value from that product by which they're still willing to consider that product and not walk away from that product. So if you get, you could get so high in price on a particular product that nobody actually wants that product and that exceeds what we call the price ceiling. So if somebody says, I'll never pay more than this amount, that's what's called the price ceiling. That's the point by which they would walk away from a negotiation or the sale of a product on that and a consumer is not interested. So thinking about things between what we call this price floor and this price ceiling is critical for us. And in between this, there are many factors. We think about our four Ps, and in particular, our price is set as one of those four Ps as part of a strategic decision on our mix. So we look at a number of things like the competition, as well as other external factors like market competitiveness in general, uh, like uh, uh, the the affluence of the uh, of the customer, the size of the customer base. So there's a lot of dynamics that we consider in between here that allows us to determine where the optimal location across the spectrum would be between the product floor and the product ceiling. So that's just a basic review again of where we want to consider setting a price for a product. Now, in thinking about price setting, there, I'm going to go through some of the major strategic mechanisms for price setting. One of the most common is what we call market skimming pricing. Now, I want you to think about iPhone because they use this market skimming pricing quite a bit. So iPhone launches of brand new iPhones generally generate a large number of people that are interested in obtaining that iPhone almost immediately following the launch of that new iPhone. And because there's such a demand for that new product that comes out, that what Apple does is they often use what's called the market skimming pricing strategy. They price that product so high that what they do is they get the people who are willing to pay that maximum amount right up at that price ceiling to obtain that product so that they're the first ones to get it. And, and, that, and then what they do is that's like skimming the top of the milk. So if we think about the milk, there's the cream that is, holds at the top of the milk. You're skimming off the top of that price group. And then after we've skimmed that price group, then we start dropping price to get the rest of the individuals. And we start doing price cut, price cut, price cut over time. And we're pulling in more to that marketplace. And that's what we call a market skimming pricing strategy. Start high, we drop to be able to skim uh, the market. and, and develop demand later on and start high and drop down on that market price. Buyers must want the product at that high, that high price in order to initiate 
a market skimming pricing strategy. Next, we have what, what we call the market penetration pricing strategy. This is when a company tries to get maximal share of the marketplace that the most customers possible by introducing their product at a price that is extremely competitive, a low price, to be able to gain the number of people using the product and then capture a large percentage of buyers on that product and what we call a large market share. So as opposed to Apple that uses the, uh, the skimming strategy, Samsung, for example, they have just the opposite strategy. They use what we call the market penetration pricing strategy. So if you notice what they do, they price their products low. So the barrier to be able to get those products is low. So a lot of people want to go out there and get it. So a large number of people initially get that product. They get used to the use of Samsung products and they stay sticky with Samsung. So the idea is to get them into Samsung, get them using it, and they stay some sort of loyalty to the product Samsung. So that's what we call a market penetration pricing. So we learned about skimming and we learned about penetration that are two differentiating strategies. So when we think about um, a product marketing uh, or a mix pricing strategies and we think about them, I want to talk about five particular ones with emphasis on a few of them. We're going to talk about product line pricing, where we think about more than one product that we represent and how we manage this line. We're going to talk about optimal product pricing, which is thinking about at any given time where that optimal point is. Captive product pricing, we'll talk about that. Byproduct pricing, and then finally product bundle pricing. So I'm going to review each of these, and these are all what we call product mix pricing strategies. You should be familiar with these because these are actually quite commonly used out there in the pricing in, in the pricing literature. So let's start off by looking at what we call product line pricing. This is where we take into account the cost of differences between products in the line. So customers evaluate the features and the competitors' prices, and they think about where in the line. So what a product line refers to is when we have more than one product that's, that's off the same line of products that, that, that we introduce to the marketplace. So I'll, I'll give you an example of that. So if we have an automobile, let's just say it's, uh, it's the Audi uh, the A5. So the Audi A5 is, is, uh, is the Audi SUV. They'll also have the Audi, uh, I'm sorry, the Q5. They'll also have the Q3, the SUV. And then <laughs> within the Q5 and the Q3, they're going to have different lines. So they're going to have the baseline. They're going to have the premium line, the premium plus line, and then the, what they call the elite line. And within that, there's more options that you get with your Audi. So for example, you might get rear, rear camera, you might get auto drive or autopilot drive. There's all kinds of elements. We might, by an upgrade, get different wheel bases. We maybe get different interiors of our vehicle. So the quality of the, of the product varies, but it's in the same product line. So when we think about product line pricing, we have to think of how we price each of those relative to each other. So for example, the Q3 versus the Q5, the Q5 is a bigger vehicle. We're going to probably have to price it higher, but we have to know where we price the Q3 to figure out where we're going to price the Q5. Now, within the Q5, we have different lines. We have the basic, uh, we have the premium, uh, and then we have the, uh, uh, the, the elite kind of brand. Within that, we have to think about how we price those relative to each other. So product line pricing considers all of the products that we're pricing within our group and, and prices them relative to one another in thinking about how they fit versus the competition. Optimal product pricing, on the other hand, takes into account optimal or what we call accessory products along with the main products. So what it says is, if we were to combine all the accessories with this product and get to a point where we could really charge the most amount for that product that we can and gather the most profits, what would that configuration look like? And how should we price our products under that configuration? That's what we call optimal product pricing. Many of you are probably familiar with what we call the captive product pricing market. Uh, many of you might even own things like Nespresso coffee machines or Keurig coffee machines. They use what we call captive product pricing. 
So what do they do? They sell you a Keurig machine and they sell it to you fairly cheap. But what they do is then they sell the pods that go into the machine in a more expensive manner. And in fact, they build the machine to only accept Keurig pods. Now, of course, there's competitors out there trying to trick uh, to be able to get pods that fit into Keurig, but Keurig is consistently changing up their machine to make it so it's difficult for them to substitute pods. So what do they do? They make their money off the pods rather than the machine itself. We see this with razors, where the razor blades, um, you can't just buy any razor blade with the razor you have because not all of them fit. So you have to buy a specific blade and the blade is expensive, but the razor itself is very inexpensive. And that's what we call captive product pricing. So you're captive to that razor or whatever you have, that Keurig machine, and you can only buy products that fit with that Keurig or fit with that razor, okay? Another type of pricing is what we call byproduct pricing. So this sets the price for byproducts in order to make the main product price more competitive. Give you an example of this. Some of the butcher shops that are out there and, and, also, uh, and also meat uh, processing shops, what they'll do is they'll cut meats and they'll build meats out to be able to sell to grocery stores. And to reduce the cost of those meats, They'll take the bones, they'll take the scraps of meat and stuff, and they'll take those and they'll sell them to pet food manufacturers. Because the byproduct, which is the bones and the, the excess scrap, is used in the production of pet food, that will reduce the overall cost of producing those meats that are distributed to the markets, and thus the byproduct of that break can be used to bring down the overall price of the main product. So having a market for the byproduct will reduce the, the, the price of the, of the main product, allowing us to what you call create byproduct pricing. This is true in many things. I'll give you another example. In the, in the paper industry, when they produce brand new paper, like these giant reams of paper that can be used in printing presses, to print magazines, to print box board, things like this, they run these on giant printing machines and they have what's, what's called uh, uh, cutters at the end of the paper. And they trim the paper to be able to make it just the right shape and consistency. And they trim off probably six inches to a foot at each end of the paper. Well, that paper at the end is not used for the regular sale, but people buy that paper, use it for notebooks, uh, 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 different types of things like receipt paper, things like this, that can be used as a byproduct to be able to reduce the cost of the overarching rolls of paper that are sold by the company. That's byproduct pricing. Next, we have uh, product bundle pricing. So this is where we combine several products together to be able to make our package of products more uh, enticing to the customer and to be able to merge the prices of those products to be able to get a more advantageous price. Many of you have got this with cable, for example. So, um, so for, for many of you, when you've moved into an apartment or a new house or something, or change locations, you, you might get want to get yourself internet. And that company that does internet might also want to give you cable. And that company that gives you internet and cable might want to give you a landline for your phone. So in fact, in fact, I'll give you an example of this Verizon, when, when you have cable and you have internet, they, they sometimes make it free to put an, a landline in. They just bundle that in. So in, in addition, so what they do is by adding these together, it's di difficult to unbundle the value of each of these individual items and it makes the pricing look more advantageous. That's true for many things. So for example, oftentimes you'll see in the store, you'll see products go together like conditioner and shampoo, they put it together. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the makeup products are bundled together. A lot of things in grocery stores, they will bundle the products together to be able to, to demonstrate further value, but it's difficult to unbundle to be able to understand pricing. An example of that is in the insurance industry in the service sector, they do this as well. So they'll oftentimes say to you, if you get um, a homeowner's insurance together with your car insurance, then we will give you a lower price because you have both, because it's bundled pricing is what it's called. So combining several products to reduce the overall price and capture a greater share of the market with that particular customer. So those are a few of the strategies. Now let's talk about why companies uh, do price changing 
and what the impact of a price change is on a company. So companies will often initiate price changes. And let's talk about why they initiate price changes. So the most common reasons that we, uh, we have price cuts are two things. One is we have excess capacity. So we've produced way too much. We have a lot of stuff in our warehouses. Uh, we've overestimated what our demand is and we have too much stuff sitting around and it's costing us money. So what do we do? We cut price to be able to alleviate that, uh, that excess uh, um, overstock of product. Another thing we do is we've increased our market share. We wanna increase our market share. So what do we do? We drop our price to be able to get more people wanting to buy our product and, and, and to be able to increase the share of the total pie of the market. So cutting our price tends to have uh, individuals who are price sensitive pull in our product and buy it. What happens with price increases? Why do we have price increases? The first is what we call the co cost inflation. So if things start to cost more to be able to produce because the raw materials are more expensive or the products that we buy uh, to be in the production of our product are more expensive, then we're gonna have to start charging more for our product and that, and that causes what we call cost inflation. So for example, if we're selling automobiles and the cost of steel goes up tremendously, it's gonna increase the cost of production and therefore the cost of our automobiles will increase. When there's increased demand, so all of a sudden we have a small supply and a lot of people all of a sudden want it. Maybe our product became popular for some reason. It was, it was demonstrated in the, uh, by, uh, on the Super Bowl. There's a bigger demand for that product. Uh, so under those conditions where demand suddenly increases, we will often see a company increase their price commensurate with that big demand increase and a lack of supply. So they can't, source that many of those products, so they have to reduce demand for the product itself. Because they can't produce enough, they want to be able to minimize the demand for that product, so they increase the price to the point where they can manage the demand for the product and yet still supply the product to the marketplace. So these are a few reasons for initiating price changes. Now, let's think about what the reaction, many of you can probably think about yourself to think about your buyer reactions to price changes. So what happens when price increases? What are your thoughts? A couple of things that we can think are positive and negative things. In one way, what happens when price increases is sometimes we think to ourselves, oh, that product's becoming popular. Um, that's why the, pro the price has increased. A lot of people want it, it must be popular. So one of the inferences that we'll often make from a price increase is that the product is hot or it's a, a lot of people want it. On the other hand, some people might think that the company is greedy. The company is trying to, uh, trying to uh, uh, sort of rob the marketplace. So as a result of that, this greediness of the company is a negative implication. So many times when we have what we call price increase situations, we have to manage the, uh, the spin through uh, on why our product is increasing. We wanna make people think it's because there's a demand for our product and not because our company is just trying to, trying to cheat the, the customer. As far as price cuts on the other side, this is when we're cutting our costs. They might think to themselves, well, the new model is gonna be available. I'll give you an example. When a new model of an automobile is about to come out, so let's, we talked about the Audi Q5 before the SUV for Audi. When they're coming, getting ready to come out with the new 2021 model and the 2020 models are still on, on the lot, they might wanna get rid of those. So what do they do? They cut their price on them to be able to get them out before the new one comes in. Because as soon as the new one's introduced, people don't demand that old one as much. Next, uh, models are not selling well. So a product isn't selling well, what do they do? They have to cut the price of the product. So that, that should send the signal of, it also oftentimes sends a signal of quality. People don't want it and you want to cut the price. Why do they not want it? Think about a house that's for sale and you, you price the house too high and it sits on the market for a long time. And then you see multiple price cuts. You say to yourself, oh, why, don't it, why doesn't anyone want this house? So it sends a signal that maybe that house isn't desirable. Maybe it's something about its location. Maybe it's something about the, the way it looks and other people don't like it. So sometimes that's a surrogate signal for external demand for that product or service. 
So this is a few ideas about what we call the impact of price changes in the marketplace. So that's about it for today. And that covers uh, some of this pricing strategy and pricing theory on that and is an extension of last uh, class. Um, I hope you found this interesting and I look forward to talking to you soon about our next chapter.